If you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 23. You can find it on page 81 in the Church Bibles. Exodus 23, reading from verse 14. Three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I have commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year, when you gather your crops from the field. Three times a year all men are to appear before me, the Sovereign Lord. Do not offer the blood of, of a sacrifice to me, along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must not be kept until morning. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. And we'll leave it there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which to us is spirit and life. Father, we ask that you would, by your spirit, would breathe that word into the hearts of each of us. Father, anoint me to speak, so that my words might be the ones that you desire me to say. And anything that I do say that's not of you, and Father, I ask that you would strike it from our ears so that we wouldn't even hear it. For that which you desire to speak, we ask, Lord, that that word will bear fruit in the hearts of all of us, that we might be drawn to you. Through Jesus. Amen. In the book of Exodus, God took a tribe of slaves Twelve tribes of slaves, and set them free from oppression in Egypt. And in the wilderness, he forged them into a great nation, preparing them to enter the promised land. And here in this passage from Exodus 23, we've got, we have God's command to celebrate the harvest. And this sets an important principle that's still good and still relevant some three and a half thousand years after it was first given. The celebration of the harvest in this passage comprises two festivals. The first comes during the wheat harvest, which in Israel comes in May to June time. It was called the festival of first fruits because it came some seven weeks after the Passover. It came at the beginning of the harvest, and the people were commanded to bring the first fruits of the crops they sowed in their fields. This was a celebration of thanksgiving to God for his provision. It recognised that God was the one who gave them the harvest. The people had to sow and plant and weed and harvest, but it was God who provided from first to last. In Deuteronomy 8, Moses reminded them, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. 
but remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as it is today. This is a defence against arrogance. Because there's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. Every good thing comes to us as a gift from God. Even our natural talents and abilities come to us from God. I remember years ago knocking on, on door knocking in my home, my home church. And certainly one, one man opened the door and said, <coughs> I've got this house, I've got that big car out there. I've got an holiday twice a year, I've got a good job, I've got everything I need, what would I need God for? What a fool. We must not deceive ourselves. Every moment of our lives, every breath we breathe, every good thing in our lives comes to us as a gift from God. We need to recognise that and live in the light of it, giving thanks to God in faith and humility. The festival of first fruits acknowledges this. God commanded Moses that they celebrate it. And the people were called to give back to God of the first things that they harvested. Now, we're never expected to give what we do not have. We offer to God in proportion of what we do. This is an expression of faith. It's brought at the beginning of the harvest season. At the end of the harvest, at the end of the year, when all the harvests had been gathered in, came the feast of ingathering. That was celebrating everything that God had done. But at the beginning, the people were, were, were commanded to bring of the first fruits of their fields. So as well as the festival of thanksgiving, it was a, a, a festival of faith. It confidently anticipated the harvest that was to come. The people expressed their faith, their trust in God to provide them with what they needed. They didn't celebrate it to bribe God into giving them a good harvest. Because God cannot be bribed. God cannot be manipulated. He cannot be bargained with. He is God. He's sovereign, but he is love. He is absolutely faithful. He's merciful. He's not capricious, but he can't be bought. The right attitude is to approach him with love, with hope, with faith, and with humility. God does not bless us because we worship him. He blesses us because he's merciful and faithful to all his promises. And he desires that we might come to know him personally and walk with him through life. In our first reading, which records what happened after the feeding of the 5,000, the people who had seen Jesus multiply one boy's meagre lunch and with it, has fed 5,000 men, plus women, plus children. They came after him, mystified at what he'd done. They'd eaten their fill and they wanted more. So Jesus said to them, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that <coughs> endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. There is something far more important than filling our bellies. 
God doesn't want us to seek his blessing or his earthly provision. He wants us to seek him for himself. We would be so foolish to seek the gift and not the giver. Jesus had said, do not work for food that spoils. So the people asked him, what must we do to do the work that God requires? As if by doing good works, we can secure God's favour, which we can't. So Jesus answered them, the work of God is this, to believe on the one he has sent. The work of God is to believe. And that word translated as believe is one that we've met so many times before. And it's such an important word, I don't apologise for expanding on it again. Because the word that's translated as believe is that wonderful word, pistuio. And that means, yes, to believe that something is true, but much more than that. It means to believe that something is true, but in the light of it, we rest our weight upon it. Because this, this fact is true, we commit ourselves entirely to it and live in the light of it. That what it, it that's what it is to truly believe in biblical terms. So the work of God is this, to believe to entrust oneself to, to commit oneself entirely to the one he has sent, to Jesus. Jesus is God and is also the gift of God. He's God's gift of himself to humanity. He is the bread of God, the bread of heaven. Jesus continued, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then he declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me, that is, whoever entrusts themselves to, whoever commits themselves entirely to him, will never be thirsty. Our daily food, the things of this life, will spoil. The thing that we desperately want today, tomorrow, will lose its luster. And we'll get bored of it. But Jesus is different. He is God. And is the only one who will truly satisfy. The only one who will satisfy and satisfy and satisfy and whose luster will never fade. I remember when I was a child, as Christmas was approaching, there was always that one thing that I really wanted. And we didn't get all the presents that they get now. We used to get one really decent present and other little ones. But I, I would want that, deep, that, pre, that big present more than anything. I remember once I wanted a telescope and I was desperate to have this telescope. Above all things, I wanted this telescope. After three weeks, it was on top of the wardrobe. And the following year, I wanted something else, and something else, and something else. All the things of this earth will lose their luster in time. The only thing that won't, the only thing that won't is Jesus. Because he is different. He is God and the only one who will truly satisfy. In Psalm 34, we're invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. And if we will, then we'll find out that he provides real satisfaction. Forgiveness of our sins, those things we've thought, said and done that are wrong, those things that are less than perfect, those things, those bad attitudes that would cut us off from the all-holy God forever. In Jesus, we find reconciliation with God. 
In him, heaven comes down and glory fills our souls. There are many who think that they have tasted and then in time fall away. But to have truly tasted and seen that God is good gives you such an insatiable appetite to know more, to come into a deeper relationship with him. I remember having an argument with one of my previous church secretaries. Which the scripture says, the go, oh, do you know, I can't remember the verse, it's gone out of my head. What it is to start to get old. <laughs> but the thing behind it was, that if you taste Jesus, then he'll satisfy you whatever. And I remember arguing with him because he said, well, you might satisfy one person, but it's not necessarily going to satisfy somebody else. You can't say that. But that's the point. If you've tasted and seen, then you are satisfied. And I do wonder if he ever truly did. Because Jesus is the bread of heaven. He's the one who gives us life eternal, that taste of heaven now. So do not merely seek the gift, the blessing. Seek the giver, for he is the far greater gift. So there were two big festivals to celebrate the harvest. The first one came as the festival of first fruits. It anticipated all that God would give. So it was a celebration of anticipation, a declaration of faith in God, and it celebrated his love. And the second big one was the celebration of ingathering the Feast of Tabernacles that we heard about yesterday. And in Deuteronomy 16, they were called to celebrate the festival of Tabernacles for seven days after you've gathered the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press, all the harvest. Be joyful at your festival. The Feast of First Fruits was a celebration of faith, of anticipation of the blessing of God. But the Feast of Ingathering was the final Thanksgiving and celebration. The two always came together, and that sets an important principle for us. Because we who have truly come to believe, that is, we who have truly committed ourselves entirely to Jesus, not because of what we can get, not because we come to church to get something out of it, Rather, we come to church to give of ourselves to God. And it's this self-giving that is the real worship. When we offer ourselves in worship to God. <clears throat> then, when we give ourselves, we can expect to receive something from Him. And as we come, and it's perhaps no confidence, no, no coincidence, that we don't worship on a Saturday like the ancient Israelites did. We will worship on Sunday, the day of resurrection, which is the first day of the week. So we come on the first day and we offer him the first fruits of the week. We give of our best to him. And this is an important principle for walking with God. We tend to think of our offering being the money that we put in the collection, the tithes that we give that support the ministry of the church. And in part, it is. But in actual fact, the real offering that we give is of ourselves to God. We bring him ourselves in commitment. And the first fruits of our time and talents in love and in service. 
all that we offer to God in service, the time that we give, that is worship. We do not give to provoke him to give. We give of ourselves in faith because God has loved us, because he continues to love us. And we walk with him in love, in faith, and in worship. We're called to bring of the first fruits to God in love and in service. We embrace those things that he is concerned about. We allow him to guide our priorities, to guide our steps, and we give to him in proportion to the blessings that he's poured out on us. In the Old Testament, in the law, a big part of it was God's concern for the poor, for those that do not have enough. And it's all there for us in the rules for the harvest in Leviticus 19. Provision had to be made for those who were in need, that all may have, may have enough. And we see the example of it in the book of Ruth. Because Ruth and Naomi arrived in Bethlehem at the time of the, of the wheat harvest. And when they arrived there, they're destitute. <coughs> They've got the house that, Ruth left, that Naomi left. And to, but to get, food, to get food to eat, Ruth went to glean behind the harvesters in, Boaz, in the fields of Boaz. And it was the command of God that the harvest, when you harvested your fields, you left some of it so that the poor could glean behind and that they could get enough. It's the heart of God that we provide for the poor. And that's why we always collect for the food bank. And that's not just at harvest, but throughout the year. God has blessed us in so many ways most particularly in the gift of Jesus. He's provided us with all that we need and we can trust him for the future. So as this winter approaches, let's recognise his provision and his great love. Let's trust him that he'll get us through it. And in response to him, Let's offer the first fruits of our lives, of our time and our talents. Because he has loved us and freed us from our sin. And he's worthy of our worship and full commitment. Let's pray. Father, we recognise that every good and perfect gift has its origin with you. That you have given us Jesus. And that those of us who have committed ourselves to him have been forgiven and accepted by you. We've tasted and seen that you are good. And we've been given that anticipation of heaven. So, Father, we ask that you will give us the grace, give us the will to offer you the first fruits of our lives in love and in service, that we might truly honour you as you have given all for us. Father, we thank you. Through Jesus. Amen.